So let's do a little bit of review. Here's some of our objectives. You ready? Are you ready? All right, here, oh, we got some, oh, oh, we got some Texans in here, I'll tell you. <laughs> they don't do that in North Carolina. <laughs> Define Christian apologetics. It's defense of the Christian faith. Yes, yeah, simply defined as the defense of the Christian faith. Explain why Christian apologetics is important. Yeah, the reason demands it, and the Bible commands it. Exactly right. Define truth. Telling it like it is. It's what corresponds with reality. It's what corresponds with reality. Just to reveal a little bit, there's some things that truth is not. Truth is not simply what works. This is pragmatism. It's not simply what coheres or make sense internally, it has, to hold it, it has to hold on to something solid. It's not what was intended, it's not what's comprehensive, it's not just what relates to people today. Truth is not just what feels good. In fact, on the contrary, many times the truth hurts. Evaluate this statement and explain why it is not valid. Christianity is true for you, but it's not true for me. What's, that, what's the issue with that statement? Absolutely right. Absolute truth is something that is defined as being true for all people in all places at all times. So the, the controversial thing about Jesus Christ is when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When he says those statements, what he is saying with extreme <laughs> exclusivity is that there is no other way. And that's why we get into some of these all-inclusive groups and we have to be very careful how we introduce ourselves into all-inclusive groups because Jesus will share his glory with no man. God said, have no other God other than me. So there's some problems with relative root, truth. First, it's self-defeating. You remember all the roadrunner technique stuff. You know, if I say there is no truth, you could say, is that true? You know, and then that you figure out that you can't even say there's no truth without using truth statements. So it's self-defeating. It's also filled with contradictions. And if relative truth is what we put our hang our hat on, then it means that no one can ever be wrong about anything, even if they are. So the summary about truth, when we think about it, is that contrary beliefs are possible, but contrary truths are not possible. You can believe something different from me, you can believe something opposite from me, and you can be wrong, and I can be right, or I can be wrong, and you can be right, but if we're talking about opposite things, we cannot both be right. We could both be wrong, or one of us could be wrong, but we can't both be right. How would you defend this statement? The Bible is wholly true in all that it affirms. Now, this is one of the more complicated ones. It's not one of these shout-out answers. But some of the evidence that we looked at, just to remind you, is the number of New Testament manuscripts. Anybody remember the number? Yeah, 5,700 as compared to a typical book of its time that would have 7 to 10 manuscripts. Early dates of the New Testament, A.D. 117 to 138. No other book from the ancient world has such a small time gap between composition and earliest manuscript copies. This is encouraging stuff. Third is the accuracy of the New Testament documents. Remember I showed you those pictures of, of how, how you can piece together because there's so many different manuscripts. It's very easy to find out anything that's maybe corrupted or damaged in the text. It's very easy to piece it together. It's, it's estimated to be 99.9% .9 accurate and also the confirmation by the early fathers. So how do we know that the Bible is true? Well, you got almost 20,000 citations from the early fathers uh, from, the first, from the late first century onward. But really when you think about the Bible, it really does come down to Jesus. Jesus is the key. He, he claimed and proved himself to be God by fulfilling prophecy. Remember the video, the, the Schoolhouse Rocks video that we watched? He fulfilled all those prophecies, hundreds of them. He lived a sinless and miraculous life. He predicted and accomplished his resurrection from the dead. So if Jesus is God, then anything he teaches is true. And we know from the scripture that Jesus affirmed the entire scope of the Old Testament. And that he also promised the divine authority of the New Testament. All right. List three reasons other than the Bible we know God exists. Anybody want to shout one out? What's that? Nature. And what's the name of that argument? Cosmological argument. A cosmological argument is basically um, the argument from beginning. If anything has a beginning, then it has a beginner. And it's obvious, even scientists will tell you, that nature creation had a beginning. And because it had a beginning, there has to be a beginner. And that beginner has to be an un caused causer. Now, somebody in my class asked me just recently uh, at Fruitland College, they said, I think it was on one of these online platforms, they said, well, why, well, who caused God? 
You know, that's the question they always ask. Well, if anything has a beginning, has to have a beginner. Well, what about God? Doesn't God need a beginning? And the answer is this. Now, you ready, you ready for a headache? Okay. You, 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 at the end of all this stuff, there ha- at the beginning of all this stuff, there has to be something that initiated it. Now, let me explain what this is. Let me throw out a phrase. The phrase is um, infinite regression. You with me? Infinite regression. Sounds smart, doesn't it? When I say an infinite regression. Now, now, here's the deal. I'm looking at that clock in the back of the room, and it's 621. And every time those little two dots did, we're another second, we're moving through time, right? Now, are you experiencing this moment? You ex- we're all experiencing this moment, right? We're here, and then now this one, and now this moment, and this moment. We're all experiencing a moment, right? Well, here we are. Congratulations. Now, here's the deal. If there were an infinite amount of things that had to happen before we experienced this moment, an infinite amount of things had to occur, an infinite, unending amount of things had to occur before we experienced this moment, when would we experience this moment? Never. And that's the problem with infinite regression. If we say that there is an infinite regression of activities and things that has to happen before this moment happens, then we would never experience this moment. But guess what? We are experiencing this moment. I told you it's going to give you a headache. <laughs> so the bottom line is there cannot be an infinite regression of things that happen before this moment. There has to be a certain number of things that happen before this moment that are initiated by an uncaused causer who has no beginning or end. He is the beginning and the end. Sound familiar? Yes. The Alpha and the Omega. It's on the front of our, our campus. And the first things I noticed. So the universe and all creation has a beginning. Therefore, it has to have a beginner. And that beginner, by design, has to be an uncaused causer, an uncreated creator. If you're worshiping something that was created, guess what? That's not God. You need to go one step past whatever that is you're worshiping. Paul talked about that, about people that worship the creature instead of the creator. Okay. The second argument, anybody want to name the other one? That was the beginning argument from beginning, cause out, uh, uh, cosmological. Design, yeah, the design argument, teleological argument, just basically says if you see design in the world, then there has to have been a designer. We talked about DNA, you know, we talked about our little toe and all this stuff. And then you talk about the universe. It's clear that there is design in our universe and in our own uh, persons. And then the last one was the moral argument. If anything is good or wrong in this world, then there has to be a moral lawgiver that gives us the gauge on how we know that. List the three major worldviews. What's one of them? Atheism, pantheism, and theism. Not going to go into that a whole lot tonight. Just want to review that with you. Explain how we know Jesus is God. Now, I want to park on this for just a few minutes because we rushed through it last week. I want to make sure we get this. I'm going to play you a video in a minute that, that really blew my mind. When we talk about God, one of the most interesting things, like when I was growing up, anybody ever hear the, the old thing about how the analogy about God is kind of like, you know, H2O, he can be water, liquid, or gas? Well, there's a little bit of an issue with that. I mean, I've used that with my own kids from time to time. But the issue with that is that that's changing. And one of the things we know about God is that he's immutable and unchanging. And that's why I like to use the triangle. It's the best analogy I can come up with. Now, when you try to describe an infinite God with some geometrical shape, it's always going to fall short a little bit, okay? But the thing about the triangle is that the triangle in its nature is threeness. And in the same way, in God's nature, he is threeness. He is one what? But he's three who's. This is the doctrine of the Trinity. I had a great conversation with Austin Riley earlier this week. I disciple him. Uh, we get together once a week. He asked me if I would disciple him. We sit down. How many of you know Austin? You guys know Austin? Young man in our congregation. And uh, so anyway, we were going through some things. And we were talking about baptism. And his question was, why did Jesus get baptized? I mean, he, John was baptizing for what? Repentance of sin. Now, of course, Jesus had no sin. So why did he get baptized? And we started chasing it down. There was a bunch of answers that we came up with. But one of the interesting things about the baptism is before Matthew chapter 3, you have 400 years of silence. And then Jesus is baptized, and, Jesus, and God speaks. The Father speaks. He said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. By the way, pride is never something that's celebrated in the Bible. 
And when God the Father talks about his son, he chooses the word pleased. He says, I am pleased with my son. But there was also, all right, so you got the son, you got the father, and then what's, what else is going on there? Who is the other person there? It's the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. This is the first picture of the Trinity. And what's going on is at the baptism. I, I was really moved by this to the point where I began to think, you know, maybe one of the major emphasis on baptism is not whether we immerse or all that kind of stuff. Obviously, baptismo means immersion. But maybe the emphasis at the baptism was to show off and to display the triunity of God after 400 years of silence. And then I started thinking about like Matthew 28. Go, make, go therefore, make disciples, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That seems to be a very important thing when it comes to baptism and displaying our faith. We have to know uh, about the Trinity. So when you think about the Trinity, and you try to answer a question like this, Christians claim that they worship one God, but they actually worship three, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. We need to have an accurate way of describing this visually, and this is the best one I could come up with, and I believe this is in your book. The triangle represents God in his infinite uh, unending, all-powerful, uh, unchanging form, okay? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, threeness. One what, three who's. But then you still have to deal with Jesus the man. And I would suggest that the circle represents Jesus the man because it's, it's touching, but it's not overlapping. Because if the circle represents Jesus as in his humanity, if that's overlapping with the infinite triangle, then you've got an infinite, finite thing. And that can't happen. How can you be infinite and finite? How can you be limitless and have limits? You can't do that. So when we look at this, we know that if we try to overlap Jesus the man with the triune uh, God the Father and his deity and his humanity too much, then you get this confusion, this thing that, that are, by the way, confused. We're trying to fuse things together that shouldn't be fused together. So this is wrong. But you also can't have Jesus who is not God. You know, completely separate, you know, because Jesus himself affirmed his deity. So this is wrong. So the best visual we can come up with is very important is the triangle and the circle. The circle touching but not overlapping the triangle. So Jesus is the way to the Father. So you think relationally, if I was trying to get to the Father, I would go through the Son, you see. And further... When you think about this, the scripture says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men, I believe is the way the scripture reads. Well, that wasn't the triangle growing because the triangle has nowhere to grow. God is fully everything that he is. So when it says Jesus grew, it talks about the circle, not the triangle. When Jesus died on the cross, the triangle didn't die on the cross. The circle was crucified. The circle went into the grave. You understand what I'm saying? Mary is the mother of the circle. Mary is not the mother of the triangle. The triangle has no mother. The triangle has no beginning, no end. So it's very important that we understand how the Trinity works so that we can confuse ourselves. <laughs> you know, that's the way I like it. One of the things that's really neat about the Trinity is no matter how long you think about it, it's still a little bit of a mystery. So let me encourage you with some of these things that we get into to do this. Instead of getting a headache over it, enjoy the mystery. How many of you like mysteries when you watch one? Sometimes some of the best mysteries are the ones that go unresolved, like women. <laughs> I'll never understand that. I live with four women. I just, I don't get it. But there is something about it that should be enjoyed. And, and I came across this video. Somebody sent this to me, and I'm not even sure what the source of it is. But it's a gentleman. He's not a theologian. He's actually a musicologist, I believe. Or he's quoting a musicologist. And one of the things he does is he uses a different a musical example. So it's just be patient with me as I, as a, a person who, who has a kind of an affection for music, let me, let me use this musical illustration to maybe open our minds up a little bit about what who and what the Trinity is all about. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus says that in John's Gospel. And in John's Gospel, Jesus is spoken of as the Son, the Son of the Father. 
Jesus the Son and the Father are intimately close in John's Gospel. So close, we're told they are in each other. Jesus speaks about the Father in me, me in the Father. They are part of each other's lives. In the early Greek-speaking church, they spoke about the interpenetration of Father and Son, perichoresis, gorgeous word. Well, how on earth do you picture that? Would someone like to come up and draw that for me? Not even the Good News Bible tries to draw that. The mind boggles, or at least the visual mind boggles. Now, both Son and Father are divine in John's Gospel. Both are God, yet they're not identical. And things get even more mind-boggling when the Holy Spirit enters the scene. For this Spirit, the Spirit of God, is also divine, also God, yet not identical to Son and Father. How can they all be together as one, yet distinctively three? If you stay with the eye alone, it's very hard to understand, as many of the greatest Christian minds have found out. So God is typically treated by many Christians as a problem to be solved. Isn't that wonderful? On Trinity Sunday in my church, you find out the glorious good news that God is a problem, a mathematical problem, to be solved. Isn't that wonderful? A picture held us captive. But what could be more apt than to speak of God as a three-note resonance of life, the three mutually indwelling without mutual exclusion and yet without merger, each filling the same space yet recognizably and irreducibly distinct, enhancing and establishing each other, alive in and through each other. And then we can speak of God catching us up in this threefold resonance. The gospel is about being caught up in God's own resonance. The Holy Spirit tunes us in to the life of God. If the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Look at this from a musicologist. This is not a theologian, this is a musicologist. Three-tone sound. None of them is in a place, or better, they are all in the same place, namely <laughs> everywhere. No difference of places keeps them apart, yet they remain audible as different tones. The tones connected in the triad sound through one another. To a musicologist. When I first read that, I thought, this is good Trinitarian theology. No, it's a musicologist. The Trinity is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be enjoyed. And the world of musical sound will open that up for you, in my own view, like nothing else. Isn't that interesting? For more information. I don't know if you understood what he was doing when he went to the piano. What he did was he, he took three fingers and he played three notes at the same time. It's called a triad. And so what he did by harmonically playing those notes all at once, they all resonate at the same time and they fill the air together and resonate together. And that's what he was saying is that a, a picture holds us captive when we try to understand the trinity of God. And so he's, he's using this musical triad. Isn't that fascinating to say that, you know, this is something that you should enjoy? I mean, how many of you, unless you're weird like me, when you hear music, sit there and think about it in your mind? No, you just sit there and you're like, oh, that's good, you know? Or not, you know, either way. <laughs> but there's something to it, and there's, a, there's this threeness to God that is to be a mystery but can still be enjoyed even though it's not a problem to be solved. All right, let's move into miracles, the truth about miracles. And if you have your hand out, this is a time when you start jotting some things down. Miracles are an interesting thing in the Bible. It's, it's one of those topics that can be somewhat inflammatory in today's environment. Strangely enough, just today I was on the way to church this morning. My daughters are now ahead of me in North Carolina. And my oldest daughter, who's 11, Madeline, she called me on FaceTime, and she said, Dad, I want you to, to read some more of the Bible to me. We've been going through the Gospel of John and Genesis together, uh, even though we've been separate. That's one of the things we've been doing. We've been reading and talking about these two uh, books of the Bible. And uh, anyway, we were in John chapter 2, I believe is where it is, where Jesus performs the miracle where he turns the water into wine, the first of his miracles. But here's the question. How important do you think miracles are to Christianity? This is, a, this, is a, this is a critical question to ask and ask and answer. Because if we give up on miracles, there's some, there are some things that, that are just non-negotiable about the Christian faith that are now vulnerable. C.S. Lewis said, if we admit that God exists, then we must admit miracles. Indeed, we have no security against it. That's the, that's the, the bargain. 
So when he looked at miracles, he said, look, if, if there is this theistic God who created and sustains the world, then he should be able uh, to perform miracles and, and would perform miracles. Now, in the Bible, there's a lot to be said about this. Um, you know, John grieved that even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe. Jesus himself said of some that they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So in a sense, the result, not the purpose of miracles, but the result of disbelief in miracles is condemnation of the unbeliever. John 12 alludes to this. Now let's talk about what a miracle is because this is one of the hardest things to nail down in today's world. A miracle is simply this, a special act of who? Of God. Yeah, it's him doing something that interrupts all the natural courses of events that are going on. It has to interrupt the natural course of events. Now the Christian concept of the miraculous immediately depends on the evidence and the existence of a theistic God. And I would suggest that the greatest miracle of all has already happened. Genesis 1.1. God, out of nothing, created something. Ex nihilo, God created something. However, there are a lot of other unusual events that happen in our world today that should not be qualified in the same way that miracles of the Bible are. And in the book, I try to talk about this a little bit. One of the things that I do in my own mind is when I think about the biblical clusters of miracles in the Old and New Testament, I kind of put them with a capital M in my mind. Because there's something special about those miracles that are captured in the text. They're different, if for only, not only if, if, if maybe for only that reason, they're captured in the text of the Scripture. They're different from any other miracles that happen. And they're also very different from other unusual activities. Now, here's six different types of unusual activities. I'm going to go through each one of them one by one. First is an anomaly. The second is magic. The third is just psychosomatic type unusual things. Satan can do some unusual things. There's also this category of things that I think is most commonly confused with miraculous events, which is called providence. God's providence. And then there is the divine act, which falls into the category of miracle. So let's go through these each one by one. The first is the anomaly. An anomaly is simply just a kind of a freak of nature. It's a physical thing, and it's natural in its patterns, and it can be predictable. Now, if you're familiar with this, um, you know, a lunar eclipse is a natural anomaly. Uh, but it is, is unusual, but it's not unnatural. You understand what I'm saying? So with, with like a, a bumblebee is what I put up on the screen. You know, scientists have struggles figuring out how bumblebees actually fly. Like, it doesn't make any sense. It's kind of an anomaly. But every time you see, that's not a miracle happening, okay? It's just an anomaly. Second category is magic. Magic is, is artistic. It's unnatural, but it's man-controlled. It's a trick. It's, it's magicians. Don't seriously, they don't seriously pretend that illusions they perform are anything more than just for entertainment. That They fool the public. Okay? They trick you. Sleight of hand. They usually involve like an innocent deception, but miracles involve no deception. A miracle is under God's control, whereas magic is under man's control. Another category is psychosomatic. Psychosomatic unusual events are simply mind over matter. They're mental in the way that they work. They require a little bit of faith, but they often fail. There's a story that I came across um, this documented of a woman who went in to see her doctor. She believed that she was pregnant for five or six months. She believed it so much to the extent that she, her body began to do what a, a pregnant woman's body does. It began to change physically, internally, and externally. She came in and saw the doctor after five or six months of being pregnant and found out that she wasn't pregnant. She had worked herself up in her mind that the mind is a, listen to me, the mind is a powerful thing. A very powerful thing. Another category of unusual events, and this is a dangerous one, is satanic events. These are evil in their power. They are very commonly associated with the occult. They're demonic, they're evil, and they're, but they are limited in power. Now, one of the most critical places in the scripture is when Jesus 
performs a miracle and does, does something, and, and then people say that he's pulling from the draw of the power of the devil. And he had some strong words for those people that said that. You remember that place in the scripture? You don't, yeah. This is a very different thing than a miraculous event. Satanic activities are real, though. Demonic activities are a reality. You don't believe me? Read the scripture, okay? It's real. Now, but here's the thing. If someone says that a miracle happened, one of the questions that you have to ask is, how do you know it was a miracle? It has to be an act of God, right? There are some unusual things that will happen in this world that may make you very happy, make you very comfortable, but they may not be coming from the source that is our, our God, Yahweh. Maybe coming from a different area. So let's look at what a satanic sign looks like. Well, it's only super normal. It's under a creature's control. It's associated with the occult. It frequently connects with other types of uh, uh, worldviews. It's associated with error and evil. Involves falsehood, prophecies, and glorifies creatures. Whereas a divine miracle is a supernatural act under the creator's control, which is never associated with occult activity. It's connected with the true God. It's associated with truth and goodness, involves prophecy, and it glorifies the creator, not the person. One other category before we get into what a miracle actually is, is the area of providential events. Providential events are prearranged events. They're divine, but they're naturally exp explained. They have a spiritual context, but they're not supernatural. The fog at Normandy is one of those. You guys know the story of the fog at Normandy. The fog comes in, and it changes the whole, the whole attack. It changes everything in a, in a positive way, if you look at it from the right point of view. But it's not miraculous because it can be naturally explained what happened. Now, I'm not trying to take anybody's miracles away from them. Hear me clearly. Miracles, I still believe miracles happen today. However, I do want to encourage you that when we lump Every unusual thing that we have happen to us or that we see in our life, if we lump all of those activities into this one category, which is miracle, then what we do is we water down one of the most important and critical concepts in Christianity. Be careful how you use the word miracle. If we get done at 7 o'clock tonight, don't say, oh, it's a miracle. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Not everything is a miracle. Not everything is a miracle. It may just be providential, you know. Maybe satanic activity. I don't know. <laughs> but we need to be careful how we qualify things. A miracle is a divine act. It's supernatural. It never fails. It's instant. It lasts. And it always glorifies God. So let's look back at our list. You know, you think... A person, let me just throw an example out there for you to think about. We won't discuss this now, but if a person is diagnosed with cancer, and probably some of you in this room, if our family has been affected by cancer, and a person goes to chemotherapy and the cancer goes away. Hey, there it is. I love it. It's, it's cool. It's not distracting at all. Yeah. If a person goes through chemotherapy and their cancer is is in, is is Resolved is, is gone. Is that a miracle? Is it providential? I mean, these are things that you have to think through and be careful how you use the word miracle. Because if you lump everything into the category of miraculous, then you water it down to the point which it has no power. A true miracle always is immediate. Okay? Always. It's always successful. It's always lasting. It always glorifies God. Miracles in the Bible, by the way, come in clusters. You have the mosaic period of miracles in the Bible, the prophetic, Elijah and Elijah, the apostolic, where Christ and the apostles. So for a miracle, for an act of God to be unmistakably from God, it has to meet certain criteria. You know, like a king has a stamp, right? You know it's from the king if it has the stamp. And certain, in the same way, miracles, like a king's seal, must be unique, easily recognizable, and something that only God can do. In other words, it has characteristics that cannot be explained by natural laws, natural forces, and anything else in the physical universe. Now, what would one of these things look like? Well, let's go back to our evidences of God. You remember the cosmological, the teleological, and the moral argument? God, we know God exists because the beginnings have a beginner. 
because designs have a designer, because anything that's good or bad or, you know, has to have a moral law. It's the same thing when you look at mirac uh, miraculous events. An instantaneous beginning of a powerful act is evidenced by the cosmological argument. It's always instant. It always lasts. Second, it has intelligent design and purpose as evidenced by the teleological argument. So if it's random and chaotic, it's probably not miraculous. There's going to be some kind of design to it. It's going to fit into a bigger, broader stroke of events. And also, it's going to promote good and right behavior as evidenced by the moral argument. And probably most important, we need to know, if we're going to identify what a true miracle is, we need to know what the purpose of a miracle is. And there's three purposes that I want to suggest for us tonight. First, every miracle that we find in the New Testament and Old Testament text, and any miracle that you may come across uh, in the real world today, out in the wild, is first of all going to glorify God, as we've said before. Second, it's going to accredit certain persons as spokespeople of God. Think about in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Every time there's a cluster of miracles, there's a new prophet of God saying something to the people of God. And that person is being affirmed by his miracles. And then the last part is that it is used to provide evidence for belief in God. So what I'm trying to do here with you guys and what, what we're trying to accomplish here is I'm wanting to really narrow down. Everybody look at me. I'm trying to narrow down what you think of when you hear the word miracle. And especially, I want you to have this special category of capital M miracles when you walk out of here that are from the mosaic, you know, from the, from the Old Testament, the, the, pro, the prophetic times, and, and the apostolic times. There's a special category of miraculous events that happened that, that served a purpose. And even today, there's a lot of unusual things that happen that we need to be very, very careful um, not to lump in the category of miracles. Someone says, look what God did in my life. And I say, how do you know it was him? I got a promotion at work. God bless me. How do you know it was God? Satan gives promotions too. Right? Right? Yes. Make sure that you're looking for the DNA of a, of a miracle before you start giving God credit for stuff. Fair enough? Now, when we think about miracles, one of the hard things about it is, is that we're talking about what I'm trying to get you to think about is what's causing the things that are happening in your life, the unusual events. And I want to go through this with you. Now, this, this is another one of those things that is going to stretch some of us. But when you think about anything that's happened in your life, like just think of an event that's happened in your life or something that's happened in your life. It doesn't matter what it is. One of the things that we do that's a mistake philosophically sometimes, and we do this with our study of the Scripture too, is we try to lump the answer to what caused that into one thing. When many times there's a whole, a whole, a whole uh, uh, entourage of things that mix together to cause something to happen. Now, I want to go through this with you tonight, and I want you to just let this marinate for a couple of weeks. We got a week off, then we're going to do world religions and cults. I'm going to come back to this. This discussion becomes extremely important when we start talking about evil, pain, and suffering. So if, if you don't get all of this right now, go back and reread it, watch it on here, and just think about this for a little while. Because there is evil, pain, and suffering in this world, yes? And we need to have an answer for why God allows these things to happen and whether he's the cause of these things, okay? And this helps. For any one thing that happens, there's at least six different causes that can go into that one thing. And I'm going to come back to this in a couple of weeks, but I want you to think about this. There's an efficient cause, a final cause, a formal cause, a material cause, an exemplar cause, and an instrumental cause. Now, if we were to take a brown chair or a house or something, you know, a wood, something that's made out of wood, the efficient cause would be that by which that chair or whatever is made. And in this case, it would be the carpenter. The carpenter is what we would call the efficient cause. The final cause is that for which it's made. And a chair is made to sit in. The formal cause is that of which something is made. The form of chairness, just the, the thought of it. The material cause is that out of which something is made, which in the chair would be what? A wooden chair would be made out of wood. The exemplar cause is that after which something is made. That would be like the blueprints. 
And then the instrumental cause is that through which something is made, like the tools. And we're going to unpack this a whole lot over the next uh, three sessions that we have together because this is absolutely critical when we get to the problem of evil, pain, and suffering. But I just want you to think about this a little bit. And that's all I'm going to do tonight is just introduce it. And what I want you to walk away with when we talk about causality and miracles, and, and especially as we go to the problem of evil and pain and suffering, is what is the cause of the pain and suffering in your life? And what I want to suggest to you is that there's not one answer to that. There's at least six and maybe a seventh. Because there's a primary efficient and there can also be a secondary efficient cause of what is happening in your life. Everybody with me? Well, let's do a little bit of review and then I want to do some Q&A with the time that we have left. We're going to take up an offering, like I said. Define Christian apologetics. Defense of Christian faith. Explain why Christian apologetics is important. It demands it. The Bible commands good. Repetition is the key to memory. Define truth. Telling it like it is. Explain this statement, how you would uh, explain why it's not valid. Christianity is true for you, but not for me. What's on the line there? Absolute truth. Absolutely. Describe how you would defend this statement. The Bible is wholly true in all that it affirms. Well, you've got all the manuscript stuff, right? And the big one that I keep emphasizing, who's the key? Jesus is the key. Three reasons we know that God exists other than the Bible. Cosmological, the beginning argument. Teleological, which is design argument. Moral argument, absolutely. List the three major worldviews. Pantheism, atheism, theism. Excellent. And remember, next week or next time we meet in two weeks, we're going to go through world religions. World religions is not world views. World views is the lens through which we see the world. World religion is a different what? God and cults are different doctrine. That's where we're heading for the next couple of sessions. Explain how we know Jesus is God. Triangle, circle, absolutely one what, three who's. How do you defend this statement? Christians claim they worship one God. They actually worship three. Same thing. The triangle, the image, how, the oneness and threeness. One what, three who's. List three reasons of the Bible. We already answered that one. Uh, these are just repeats, sorry. The ones for tonight. Define the word miracle. Yes. A special act of God that interrupts the natural course of events. Yep. List three reasons why miracles are Christ critical to Christianity. Glorify God. A credit. Yeah. Provide evidence for God. Yeah. By the way, Paul says that if Christ, all right, Christ predicting and accomplishing his own resurrection is pretty cool. And it's pretty critical. What is it that Paul says about it? He says, if Christ is not raised from the dead, in other words, if that miraculous event is bogus, then we are the most pitiful of people. We have nothing to hang our hat on. Miracles are critical to Christianity. You cannot give up any ground in this area without giving up Christianity. It has to be there. After Mother's Day, we'll look at the truth about world religions, but we do just have a, a few minutes left over tonight. Anybody, I thought I might just answer a few questions. Q&A, anybody got a question about tonight or any of the first section? Yes, sir. I'm saying that Mary was the mother of Jesus, the man. But in order to be the mother of God, she would have to somehow be divine. And the issue with that is that Mary was a created being. And a divine being is uncreated. Yeah, so Jesus, there's, God has no mother. Yeah, God has no mother. You ever heard that old question, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? It's a great question. You think about that for this week, too. But God has no mother, for sure. Yeah. Well, I was listening to a program on the radio. It was Lutheran, not Catholic. Yeah. But they asked, was Mary the mother of God? And I thought, no, that's what the Catholics believe. But then they said, if you say no, what is it that you believe about Jesus? I would say that, and this is how I would describe it, in a room like this where I've had the opportunity to discuss this already, I would say that Mary's the mother of the circle, but not the triangle. The triangle has no mother. The triangle has no beginning. Yeah. Mary served as the mother of the man, Jesus Christ, in his humanity. Yeah, and that is, that is swimming upstream from Catholicism. Yeah. 
A lot of confusion about Mary in, in Catholic teaching. Great question. Yes, sir. Well, and they don't serve the same purpose. It, you could say that anything that's in the Scripture, in the canonized Scripture of the Old and New Testament, just because it's in the Scripture is different from any other miracle. Because not only was it a miraculous event, it was also inspired to be written down. Okay? You see what I'm saying? So God inspired someone to write that down in the Scripture. So it serves a greater purpose than – a, not a greater, a different purpose. Let's just say different. There is a school of thought, the Satanists out there, that believe that there are no uh, – the, the work of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and all these things have ended and ceased. That's where the, these things have ended. I struggle with that. I struggle with that. I don't know that that's the case. I do have a high regard for the New Testament and Old Testament scriptures. Uh, and this is something you can chew on yourself and think on it yourself. But, um, but yeah, those miracles in the Bible for me uh, are really, really critical more critical than the ones that happen today, if for no other reason, because they are housed in the scripture. And that's kind of the point that I was making. Yeah. Not trying to take anybody's miracles away tonight. Okay. God is at work. <laughs> Don't hear me wrong. And he is doing miraculous things day in and day out. We just need to make sure that we give him credit for the things that he's doing and not the things that someone else is doing. It gets real confusing. Yeah. Yes. Anybody else? Yeah. Go for it. What's that? Say that again. Greater things, yeah. Yeah, and I think that the uh, the there's a lot, there's several different ways to interpret that. Uh, and again, obviously, you know, Paul, uh, you know, he put somebody. To, he's he's a worse speaker than I did. He put a guy to sleep, <laughs> fell down, died. He brought him back to life. Uh, so yeah, they did miracles. Yeah, absolutely. There's miraculous events, and those a lot of those are housed in the scripture, like that one. Uh, so they they, ca they count in my mind is that capital M miracle. Um, however, I do think that the point I'm trying to make today is not that miracles don't happen, but that I'm I have a genuine concern that we are calling so many things miracles that there's confusion about what a miracle actually is today. And if I'm going to argue that miracles are credible, I want to argue for the right thing and not for everything. Does that make sense? Yeah, go for it. You got two more minutes. Yeah. 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 Sure. I have no issue with that. Absolutely. Now, here's the thing that I would I would encourage to think about when we and this is a great question to ask. I've always wondered about this because you know you, you, when you pray, from our perspective, it feels like God responds to us. You ever feel like that? Like he's listening and he's, he responds? The issue with that is that God can't react to you. He can only be proactively ready for what you're going to ask. This is the way one of my mentors, Norm Geis, who wrote the foreword for this, he said it this way. He's, and I don't know if I put this in the book, but this really uh, hit a home run for me. He said, if your child were running a slight temperature before they went to bed and you thought that it was going to escalate overnight, you might go ahead and set out the medicine and have everything ready for them if they cried out from a temperature. However, you would not medicate them proactively until they cried out. So you're all ready. You're set up. You, have, you are prepared to meet whatever need that they have that evening as their temperature rises. You've got it all ready, and you will act on their behalf. But you're proactively acting, and that's the way God works. God is, is proactively ready to meet every one of our needs when we cry out to him. So there is something about prayer that moves the hands, that moves the world. You know what I mean? There is something to that. But God is so cool. He's not sitting up there and he's not waiting for us to knock on the door of prayer and go, oh, oh, what do you need? What do you need? He knows it. He knows it. In fact, the scripture talks about the Holy Spirit praying on our behalf when we don't even know what to pray for. It's like God already knows what we need even when we don't need it. And he's proactively ready to, to, to act, not to react to us. 
sure. I wouldn't say that it was either or. I would say that he was ready for it to happen and we asked. That's what I would say. I wouldn't separate those two. Yeah, God is proactively ready to respond when we call out to him. Yeah. Sure. That's right. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Joyce. I'm not familiar with enough with that to respond to that. Yeah. I, we, that may be something we need to talk about afterwards. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The thing that we can't walk away with when you understand that God is unchanging, you can't walk away and say that our prayer changes God. Our prayer communicates with God, and God, through prayer, it, listen to this, prayer is God's way of getting his will done on earth not our way of getting our will done in heaven. So when we pray to God, it's, Father, you know, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come on earth you know, as it is in heaven. Those are the statements that we're making. And that's why sometimes, here's the deal, sometimes our prayers aren't answered. Right? It's because God is not moved by us. He moves us. He's an unmoving mover. He's an unchanging changer of all things. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it, I'm not familiar enough with it. Honestly, I just don't know. I'm not familiar with the event, so I don't want to speak into it. But, yeah, I understand what you're saying there. Yeah, for sure. Great questions. Yes, sir. All the time. That's right. Look, we posted something on our Facebook page. The, the, by the way, if you haven't liked the Hyde Park Baptist Facebook page, you do that before you get home tonight on your phone or when you get home, however you do that. We, we have uh, been posting things out. And literally, just I was just watching it, uh, Russell, we, something we posted from the prayer conference, like 800 people viewed it in just a couple of days. I mean, it's crazy the way we communicate. So, yeah, that's a great point. But, yeah. Again, not trying to take away anybody's miracle. We do need to end here, and I'll be happy to answer any more questions afterwards. We're just a couple of minutes past. And, and definitely not belittling prayer, but we want to make sure that we understand that God is so great that he is not responding to us. He is proactively ready to act when we call out to him. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Kent, our gentlemen are going to get in place to take up an offering. We'll be stationed at all doors. Remember, you get in for free. We're just going to pay to get out. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Pay attention to those guys. And if your question didn't get answered tonight, just for time's sake and to be sensitive to everybody, I'll hang around here and be happy to talk with you individually. Also, if you want to email me or get me on Facebook, send me your questions. I love this type of stuff. I do this all the time. I've got a class of about 40 guys that are doing this online, and they're always coming up with questions on our online forums. So it helps me learn as well. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to look at your word tonight. Father, we thank you that you are the one true God and that you have decided to reveal yourself uh, to us in a way that we can understand and connect with. Lord, we thank you that you call us not just to, to know you, but to experience you. Lord, we thank you that we can know you, but we can never know all of you because you are so much bigger than us. You are so much more powerful than us. Lord, who are we to even... Lord, it's just a humbling thing to think about who you are. Father, we thank you that you are miraculously interacting with this world or through your your creative process, through your sustaining process, Lord, through the, the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, so much of what we believe is, is, is made credible by the miraculous events, Lord, your son even said, if you don't believe in him, believe in the miracles that he performs. So, Lord, we thank you that we can stand solid, not only that miracles are possible, but they've, that they've happened and that they are critical to our faith. Lord, we thank you that when we, can, when we uh, need you, that we can cry out to you, and we know that you're not just surprised by the things that are going on in our life, but, Lord, that you already know and that you are proactively ready to respond in a righteous and right way in our lives with the things that we need. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said together. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. Two weeks. Two weeks.